Okay, we are back again. And like I said yesterday, history of English, you can sum up a few of the key events that changed Old English to Middle English and Middle English to Modern English in terms of invasions and inventions. And we talked about the invasions, so starting with the invasion of the Anglo-Saxons, charging in, bringing their Germanic dialects with them that became Old English around 500 CE onwards over you know, waves. And then another invasion in 1066, invasion number two, we've got the Normans bringing in Norman French and the interaction of their Norman French because they took over and they're running the joint and their French being dumped on top of the native English used by the peasants sort of turned it into Middle English. We're going to move on from invasions. We're going to move on to an invention and a very important invention that completely changed Europe. So, first of all, meanwhile, in China, around 1000 CE, uh, the, very, the first evidence that we found of anywhere in the world doing printing with a machine where you actually had the letters, or in the case of Chinese, the individual characters, each on a little piece of material that you could move around, you could put in a tray, and then print a page with it. So... Lots of parts of the world have been doing printing before that, but usually they'd been doing a block print where you'd sort of design a whole page of a book and then you'd make a template of that and you could stamp a whole page in one go. But somewhere along the line, someone, and the first place we found who did it uh, for sure is in China, uh, actually have the individual letters and stuff on little pieces. So you can just rearrange them in whatever order you want, make your page of text, print, page, print, page, print, page. Before this time... Books were extremely rare and extremely valuable, and you could only get a new book by copying it out by hand, which is extremely slow and requires you to be able to read and write. Uh, most people were not able to read and write in these days, and copying out a book by hand was something that mostly just like monks and stuff in a monastery might do. So anyway, it was happening in China for a bit. They were printing books. And the first person to do it in Europe... Whether he got the idea from hearing about it through Asia, some people suggest maybe there was cross-pollination of ideas. Maybe he came up with it on his own. Who knows? <coughs> you have to ask a historian to be sure. But the first person to do it in Europe, the person who's credited with completely changing uh, the face of Europe and the information revolution that happened, was in the 1400s, a guy in Germany called Johannes Gutenberg. So he was a metal worker. He was very skilled at making things out of metal. And he learned... Uh, or sort of figured out uh, how to make l individual letters out of metal, out of lead. And then each of these little letters, you could move them around and you could make whatever words you wanted. So you didn't have to make a whole page as a brick. You could make any page you want with any text you want just by shifting the letters around. You make, okay, here's my page. I've rearranged all the letters. Stamp, book, stamp, book, stamp. And you'd print out all of these pages and then you could make books very quickly. The first book that he did or the first major book that Johannes Gutenberg made was the Bible. Because back in those days, people were very, very religious. Society was very superstitious. Uh, that was often the only book that people would have exposure to was on Sundays. Uh, you'd go to church and there'd be the Bible there. The rest of the week, you'd spend your time farming or, or whatever that you needed to do to stay alive if you were a peasant. But suddenly, because you could print books very quickly... Uh, the whole process became much cheaper. And so information was suddenly being spread around. And it's hard to overstate this. The, the impact that this had on society was enormous. The first person who brought it to England and started printing in English, so not long after Gutenberg had built his machine in Germany, a guy brought it to England, 1476. Uh, this man, William Caxton. So we've moved on from invasions. We're talking about an invention, and that invention we're talking about is the printing press. And William Caxton setting up the printing press in England completely changes the English language. It sets off the dominoes that completely, completely revolutionise uh, literacy and education and knowledge in England and, in the process, completely upend the language. Here's a painting of him presenting it to whoever the king and the queen were at the time. Uh, you know, it's caused a huge stir. And boom, big change. Books, printed books, lots of books. Suddenly there are books available to relatively normal people. This created 
an information revolution right across Europe. It was the beginnings of suddenly there's a possibility that most people can learn to read and write. Obviously, that took another couple of centuries to work its way through. But it meant that things like mass education was somehow was suddenly possible. It meant that the Renaissance could happen. If you heard of the Renaissance before, that it's French and it means rebirth because it was like the rebirth of classical culture after over a thousand years of, of the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. Suddenly, there was lots of science happening. Suddenly, there were people learning stuff because they had access to books, and these books were just spreading information around. Now, in England, Caxton, William Caxton, who brought in the printing press, he had the revolutionary idea of saying, even though all of our brainy intellectual books and stuff are in languages like Latin, uh, maybe, maybe I'm going to have a go and I'm just going to print books in English and, you know, that regular people can read. And he did a lot of his own translations because he'd get books that he wanted to translate into English. Apparently, his translating skills were a little bit sketchy, uh, but that's okay because it meant that there were a lot of decisions that he had to make, which then had a big impact on English. Um, because there's a big challenge for him. At this time, uh, Middle English was spoken very differently in different parts of the country because if you have just a little village and most of the peasants who live in the village only talk to each other, and they don't talk to people, you know, even maybe an hour's walk away and stuff. The people in the village will come up with their own slang for things. They'll come up with little in-jokes that eventually just become the word. Different pronunciation will shift and stuff like that. And so you had this really massive variety of dialects of Middle English spoken around England. And there was no standardization for how to write it. No one had any, there was no, this is the correct spelling. Like it was all kind of, you just wrote however you wanted to because no one was setting the rules at this point. There was no standardization. And a famous story about this, which Caxton actually refers to uh, in one of his books, there's the egg story of a, of a traveling merchant who is uh, traveling through part of England and he needs some food and he went to a farmhouse. He knocks on the door and he asks the woman who lives in the farmhouse, can I please buy some eggs from you? The, the, the woman there in confusion said, I'm sorry, I don't speak French. And he said, I don't speak French either. And one of the people with him said, oh, she doesn't, she won't understand eggs. Down here, they call them iron. So different parts of England, even though they're technically both speaking Middle English, may not understand or even have the same word for different things. She did not recognize the word eggs because in the part of England where she lived, the regular word for eggs there was still iron, a bit like Eier in German, which in modern German is still the word for egg. Yeah, or eggs is Eier. So different parts of England may have had totally different words for things. So he had to decide, okay, what's the word that I'm going to use when I write books in English and I print them for people? And he comment, he actually he actually referenced this story at the start of one of the books he translated. He wrote this. It's a bit hard to read the font there. If you want to pause it and you want to try and puzzle it out, go right ahead. If you can't be bothered doing that, here it's written in a font that you can read. Basically, he said, what should a man in these days now write? Eggs or iron? Certainly, it's hard to please every man because of diversity and change of language. That is a brilliant quote. And that quote is still extremely true today. Like, you can't please everyone who speaks a language because we all speak the language slightly uniquely. Every one of you has a very slightly unique version of English in your head that's unique to you. So if you're trying to standardize a language, who do you please? Like you've got, if you've got a language that there are lots of dialects spoken, which dialect do you choose to be the right one and stuff? And this happened because he's printing all these books, a standard arose. He needed to be able to write things in a common version of English that everyone would be able to read. And so printing all these books led to a standard English orthography arising sort of organically. Uh, it was based on London pronunciation because that's where he was working and that's where, or that's where sort of, uh, you know, most of the rule, uh, the royals and stuff were, were, were living and a lot of the influence was from London. So that kind of, that southern dialect of English became the standard. And from this whole process at that time, we get early modern English. So this is kind of the first part where it really turns from ye olde what, what's going on here to something that we would recognize as, yeah, that looks kind of like normal English. Okay, we'll go on with this tomorrow.